Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the 4.30 to 6 o'clock session of the Cloud Futures 2010. This session is about systems, and we will have three presentations. Uh, the first one is by T.S. Mohan from um, uh, Infosys in Bangalore. He's going to be talking about domain-specific software architectures, uh, followed by Tatiana uh, Simonic Rossing from the University of uh, California, San Diego, followed by Zach. Zach Hill from the University of Virginia. Uh, the presentations are going to be 20, 25 minutes, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll have about five minutes for questions, and then hopefully we will finish in 90 minutes uh, the whole session. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Um, good afternoon, and uh, I'm going to present to you some of the work that we are currently doing. Uh, this is a joint work between uh, me, based in India, and uh, Professor Nenad Medvedovich, who is uh, working with the USC, University of Southern California, and Chris Matman, who works for Jet Propulsion Lab in uh, NASA. Of course, he is also an adjunct professor in USC. Uh, this work uh, essentially is based on certain things that uh, has been done trying to understand grid computing technologies and how uh, people who tried to program the grid had run into various kinds of problems. So we did an analysis of that kind of code, and then we thought that uh, trying to extract some architectural uh, patterns out of such things uh, uh, would be of use, because if somebody else wants to uh, write code, they could do a better job. But then we thought, would it not be good to leverage that into the world of cloud? Because uh, nowadays, uh, everybody wants to do the cloud programming. However, when you try to write a large application, and when you architect for a large application, more so from the industry viewpoint, uh, you run into all kinds of problems. In fact, uh, the biggest uh, challenge has been that if you say you're migrating the cloud, people think that you're just doing a database migration from a database in your local uh, data center to maybe a database in the cloud. It's too crude, too simplistic. We are looking at all kinds of problems that can happen, the patterns that can be leveraged, and how to go about it. So uh, the big question that we hit upon when we tried to look at uh, migrating into the cloud was, have we really understood the cloud? Because uh, what we found was there are too many definitions, too many terms, and too many usage patterns, too many technologies involved, and uh, consistency across the board was missing. There are lots of clusters of activities going on, common terminology, and a lot of confusion. So the biggest uh, challenge that we find is that there are, there's hype, there are a lot of domains, and domains have their own specific uh, usage patterns, right? Yesterday we had heard about a uh, lot of how the cloud has been used for the worldwide telescope project. That is one side. We also heard about the Microsoft Biology Foundation using the cloud for analyzing data in huge uh, uh, large scale. And uh, the usage patterns looked very different. So, but then, interestingly, the underlying technology was same because that's Microsoft's Azure. Uh, if you look at how it happens around the world, we see that there are lots of open source packages like Hadoop, uh, like, uh, say, the Amazon getting used, like people wanting to set up their own private clouds and uh, struggling there. And when you see how they want to use a, move an existing application onto a cloud, then things kind of start fall, uh, falling apart. So that kind of set the background for our work. And uh, we found that somewhere along the line, things will mature up, and we'll have better understanding of what typically a cloud should be and how we should go about using it. So what is it that really clicks for a cloud? Is it just these three things like what uh, you heard all the keynote speakers talk about, the paper use, wherein there's no capex, only opex, or an ability to meet seasonal loads? or what Dave Patterson called as the search computing. 
So I have my computing that happens on a regular basis. Suddenly I have an extra load. I just move to the cloud for that part and then come back. Scaling down was a very interesting aspect. And uh, it's, it's also a case where because of the hype, we kind of see that there's a uniform, simplified abstractions being presented for programming the cloud. And that seems to be pretty seductive. So people <coughs> say, let's do it on the cloud. But when the reality bites, that's when we start wondering as to where we went amiss. So uh, large applications are missing on the cloud. Large data has been processed on the cloud, but the applications have been simple. So this is the kind of uh, experience that we, uh, we are having in trying to understand the programming being done in the cloud. The service offerings and vendors, we see that on one end of the spectrum, we have large players like the Microsoft Azure, or the Google App Engine, or the Amazon Web Services. The other end of the spectrum, we have a lot of small niche players, and these are all cloud enablers. There are a lot of these startup companies which say that, look, give me a problem, we'll try to help you get the best out of the cloud that is there. And typically, the guys who go to these small companies are IT departments of various enterprises. So what happened to the in-between part? Big players on one end, small players on the other end, in between what's happening. And that in between what's happening is what many of us in the IT outsourcing industry, IT industry, are trying to grapple with. Because what we find is large enterprises have captive data centers. They have a lot of these technologies like virtualization, which some of them are already using it. But can they have a private cloud? And when it comes to that question, a lot of questions are not answered. In fact, uh, that's one of the big reasons why a lot of the enterprises are kind of sitting on the fence when it comes to moving to the cloud wholeheartedly. They might want to do search computing, but they will not want to do cloud computing per se across the board. So the big question then, then get asked is, if there's a value add, what is the kind of value add? Is it only economic? Is it only that the cost of IT comes down? Or is it that things will be a lot more easy, a lot more standard compliant, a lot more portable, a lot more interoperable? lot more in quotes secure, like what Dave was saying. We all have our uh, information kept on the cloud, assuming that we <coughs> trust that, that the security that they give us is good enough. And yet, when it comes to thinking about it, we ask these questions like, is it secure? right? And how sustainable is it? This is the other question that gets asked. Can I run a business long term on the cloud without depending on anything? So there are, of course, a lot of uh, key issues and challenges for sustained usage. And that's where industry people like us step into the picture. Uh, we want to ask, how do you handle this thing called consistency? How do you handle this thing called availability? How do you handle this thing called performance? When it comes to doing, say, uh, in quotes, transaction processing of a business on the cloud, right? In fact, uh, all the popular usage on the cloud has been when information could be inconsistent and that's acceptable. It could fail. And it could be a case where the performance is pretty poor. And in spite of it, people are happy with the information that they get. That's the kind of applications that uh, uh, people are uh, working towards on the cloud rather than uh, doing the real hardcore business transaction processing. Now, how secure is the information on the cloud? That's get, that, that gets asked. And Dave Patterson beautifully gave a reply. He said. When we file our taxes with IRS, maybe IRS is processing much of our information in their data centers, which are possibly accessible to a lot of people. Right? We don't ask how secure is that information that we give them. Right? We submit our information to our lawyers and advocates, or the legal attorneys, and they process that information using possibly public resources. We don't ask questions. So why ask such questions which only mean that you are aware of certain issues that everybody has been talking about, but you're not really experienced. In fact, our little analysis of the shelf, of the cuff, should I say, back of the envelope analysis kind of shows that about 60 to 70 percent of the information that generally gets used up in the enterprise, and which is not mission critical, need not be of that high security category that we really worry about. And given that uh, situation, uh, I think in the future, maybe going forward, maybe next two, three years or four years, we see that a lot of applications will move onto the cloud at the enterprise level. But then, of course, the enterprises have to make a choice. Would they like to keep it in their private data centers and their private clouds, or would they like to use 
the cloud offerings by various public cloud service providers. That's the choice. And that's where we find that many of the kinds of questions that we ask for this particular topic that we are ask, talking about, leveraging the domain-specific architectures for uh, applying it to the cloud service uh, abstractions right now, uh, can we make life simpler and easier? Interoperability and portability has been a big issue. A lot of the proprietary service providers have kept their APIs kind of closed. Of course, uh, there's the pricing model that also gets fitted in. And if you closely observe, price for moving data into is cheaper than price for moving data out of the cloud. Many of these service providers kind of built in, build in this barrier there. But in spite of it, uh, there has been attempts by enterprises to kind of have a hybrid model where there is the sensitive data that gets kept in their private data centers. Parts of it is taken, processed across the cloud service offerings, and perhaps done in such a way that even if, say, one part of uh, Microsoft Azure uh, fails to live up to certain parametric standards or uh, parameters of performance, it also gets processed on, say, the Google App Engine, and uh, things still move forward. So in such a situation, you need to have a very interoperable setup. Programming for that is a huge challenge, and that's something which uh, we look forward to, and look forward to best practice by which we can go forward. Variable seasonal cloud service pricing. Uh, spot instances, bidding for spot instances on the Amazon server. It's a very interesting example of what the future could be because all said and done, the number of resources, uh, the quantum of resources available to even the large service providers is finite. And it's all a question of how they manage it when it comes to us asking for it. And the way they will manage it is they will move on to a bidding uh, situation where prices keep varying and the challenge for the enterprise architects would be would it be economic to use the public cloud service offerings when the price varies? Because at a certain point of time, it's meaningful. Beyond a certain point of time, you may not want to uh, schedule any tasks on the public cloud, right? So that, that becomes a big factor, and uh, understanding that is important. Similarly, you have issues like multi-tenancy and reputation sharing. These are all things which have been talked about, but then uh, I will touch upon it later. So the big challenge again comes here. I want to migrate my big enterprise application into the cloud. Where do I, how do I go about it? Do I just move the application as is to the cloud, which means like I go and use it uh, on the Amazon uh, as IT uh, system administrator would like to do without touching anything inside? Or should I go fine tune it, program, perhaps reprogram it and use the platform that uh, say Azure or the <coughs> Google Apps Engine provide? Or should I uh, possibly use an application which is already available to us on the net? And uh, maybe that is kind of based on the cloud or a private cloud. Like, for example, if you take salesforce.com, I'm sure they are using a lot of the cloud technologies to run the show. If you look at Gmail, all of us use Gmail or Hotmail. And uh, if you closely observe, much of the way in which it happens is the cloud technologies get used. We may not even be knowing about it. So depending on what application, what level would we like to get into, step into? This is the kind of uh, uh, challenge that comes for a typical person who wants to migrate the application in. And typically, when we talk about uh, enterprise applications, it's not like one particular functionality or a certain uh, focused uh, things. It is typically an ecosystem. Uh, an application doesn't live in isolation. So it is that it's connected to a number of other applications, and you would want to migrate into various parts. How do you put that together? This enterprise application integration, which was a big topic, say, several years back, and then came SOA, service-oriented architecture, web services. All that kind of means that when we move to the cloud, they all, all pop up in various shapes and forms, and that's a big challenge. How do you address that? That's the kind of a challenge or a issue that we are looking at. And what did we find? It's kind of a compromise. Yes, we cannot have a 100 person move into the public cloud because we do not know. Public clouds don't promise anything. They don't give you SLAs which guarantee uh, what's called as 5 nines performance, no? 5 times 9999999 percent or whatever it is. You can't run your own private cloud because uh, if you want to have a cloud, which is really meaningful in the cloud sense, in your private data center, you really need to have scale. 
and you really need to manage well. It doesn't make sense. Then what do we do? We kind of come up with something which is hybrid in between. We use combinations of this. It's not that just because the cloud has become such a fantastic uh, IT uh, disruptive technology available to all of us, we abandon the uh, data center within the enterprise and move on to the cloud. At the same time, we are not going to augment it either. So the judicious combination or judicious use of both is where the path is. And when you want to do this hybrid cloud, what do we leverage? Where do we go about? So these are the kinds of things that comes. Do we use combinations of uh, infrastructure, combinations of parallel platform, or combinations of software as a service that comes in to be able to put together the small ecosystem of applications that kind of uh, represents the application that you have in mind? So what level do we leverage? Second is, what is the cost model like? Because a program that uses a particular cloud service offering with a certain pricing model will be meaningful. But then when the prices shoot up, you'd want to shift. That agility is something which everybody looks forward to. Can we build in the agility? In fact, the architect who designs these kinds of solutions has an additional dimension to think about, and that's the variable pricing part. And there are associated risks with it. What configurations and deployments do we attempt? Do we have a certain deployment which then can be revoked and moved on to another deployment? Think about it because in the real world, in the world of the enterprises, applications continuously change their, uh, they kind of metamorphosize continuously. They don't, they're nothing like static uh, uh, picture or notion of an application. So given all these kinds of big picture uh, situations in the industry, the question that gets asked is, can we apply the principles and uh, discipline of software engineering when using cloud services? What do you mean is the question. So when we develop an application or when we put together, integrate a bunch of applications on the cloud, can we use the methodology, the metrics, the software engineering principles, and then come up with the mechanisms and means which can help people estimate the costs correctly, estimate the defects properly, ensure that the reliability is really properly handled and managed and maintained. So these are kinds of issues that we face in a typical software industry, but can we do that? That's a question that comes. And in that context, we have an answer. And the answer is there's something called domain-specific software architectures. Uh, if you closely observe, applications don't live in isolation. They are clusters of applications <coughs> solving certain class of problems in a certain domain. And there are a lot of interesting things that go along with it. So uh, there is uh, this uh, nice, interesting book called Software Architecture, Foundation Theory and Practice, which has been uh, uh, co-authored by one of the authors of this uh, presentation, Professor Ninad Medvedovic. And in that, you'll find a certain definition wherein we talk about uh, domain-specific architecture comprising a reference architecture, a component library, an application configuration method, and how this reference architecture can be used to make a lot of principal design choices. So moving forward, we did an analysis of a lot of grid technologies. See, we wanted to apply some of these understandings and see how uh, grid programming packages like these, how do they go about with uh, implementing their understanding with respect to the reference architecture that they talk about. And then we found that there are a lot of interesting uh, inferences that one can draw upon and how these kinds of technologies have been used by the applications that have been using. The good thing about Grid is that both above in the application level and below at the systems level, things are visible. But in case of clouds, typically from the public service uh, offerings, you will see that it's opaque. You cannot really understand how Google manages its Google, uh, Google uh, uh, file system or what Microsoft does with respect to its uh, database or data management, right? There's, of course, there's a certain understanding, but nothing beyond it. This kind of gave us certain insights. What is, what is the third column? K S L O C. Kilo uh, source lines of code. Okay. From this, we could extract this kind of uh, uh, abstraction, and this is a very high level, by the way. Each of these boxes represent a certain a set of uh, abstract uh, calls, APIs, which specify the architecture and which are kind of cutting across several of these implementations. Like for example, there is this uh, uh, thing called the runtime collective, which does a lot of this runtime management aspects of a typical grid system. There is this resource uh, um, uh, 
abstraction which captures within itself things like storage, things like database, things like uh, persistence, etc. And there is the fabric part which talks about the communication part. This is with respect to the grid. Now, can we apply these kinds of abstractions in the world of cloud? That's the challenge. And if we apply, can we influence the way the migration to the cloud happens such that it's really optimal? That's the, that's the kind of uh, challenge that we are taking up. And in that context, we looked up a number of, uh, uh, what do you call, things that we get to do when we do cloud programming. And it's typically what's been talked about for a long time, you know, the distributed systems fallacies, like, for example, the, in the cloud, the network is fully reliable, which is not true, that there's zero network latency, which is, again, not true, because maybe within a rack, the latency is pretty small, but across racks or within a data center, it could be a little larger. And across multiple data centers, absolutely big. So these kinds of assumptions that we make can impact the performance of the application, right? So these are a bunch of things that has been true for a long time in the distributed systems. And this affects the way the cloud programs are uh, configured, deployed, or programmed, OK? And if you closely observe, there are other things which are also to be worried about. But then we do not have a direct handle in the cloud abstraction, cloud service abstractions, like either in the infrastructure or in the platform, where we explicitly can play around at this level. So, Keeping these kinds of things in mind, keeping that DSSA in mind, what are the typical steps that we go through for migration? Perhaps first we evaluate and assess what options we have when we split an application across into components, see which components need to go which part. Then we do a pilot for the right level of migration, check it out, and then re-architect or redesign or recode that whole component so that it migrates in full. And then having done that, we leverage the platform advantages, and then we, of course, look at the larger picture. There's a platform, but then there's a larger picture of multiple of these put together. And then we validate it. Once we validate it, of course, we refactor, reiterate, and refine. These are the kind of uh, migration steps that we get through. Having done that, what is it that we have kind of come to? We have come to reclassify the kind of cloud services abstractions that we would like to look at. And that too from a domain-specific architecture viewpoint for a class of generic programs. And these abstractions, like this, the domain-specific application services abstraction is kind of core to a software as a service thing. A platform runtime collective service is core to a, the platform as a service, uh, uh, service cloud offering. The runtime collective services abstraction is the one which manages the cloud within, say, the Amazon. The resource service abstraction takes care of uh, storage, like S3. And of course, fabric services of abstractions handle things like the MQ message queuing support, which is there in the this. And having said that, uh, we are studying a lot of applications to get the things in place. And of course, what does it mean in the existing setup? These kinds of stuff. So this kind of combines both. Like we have a typical infrastructure as a service, wherein you can explicitly ask for runtime support. You can explicitly ask for S3 inter interface, and you can communicate between the various server instances. Now, this is what infrastructure as a service would be in the kind of abstractions that we have, the reclassified one. Same case with platform as a service, and same case with the software as a service. In fact, uh, while this looks very abstract, there's a lot of detailed work going on. And uh, I think, given the time, I would like to stop at this level of abstraction. And uh, how? Challenging is it to do this job? To be very clear, we got opportunities or options to either re-architect the whole application or parts of it, redesign the same architecture, reference architecture, but redesign it, or perhaps re-implement it in a different uh, programming platform. That is one part. Again, the other part is we need to keep these kinds of issues in mind or parameters in mind. And when we look at it, the kind of options that we have, on one side, we have the private data center or private cloud with the private the code we take an application, we split it into parts, we take one part, we can either keep it sequential as is, or we can run it in one of the three modes within the cloud, right? And on the public cloud too. So the number of options are humongous, too many of them. So this number of options into this number of options is what we need to consider when we want to do the migration. This kind of gives the big picture of what I wanted to say, and uh, I stop here. Thank you. So we can ask questions without having to go around with a microphone.
because we have microphones on the ceiling. So please um, uh, ask questions uh, to our speaker. You were surprisingly very clear. <laughs> Thank you. So what is what Infosys is? Uh, what is the position of Infosys vis-a-vis -vis the cloud? What are the plans? That's a good question. Which a lot of I, I told you on one side. On end of the spectrum, we have the large service providers mm -hmm. like Microsoft or Amazon who have huge uh, captive cloud platforms. Mm -hmm. The other end of the spectrum, we have companies like RightScale, Cloudera, and these are all small companies, those expertise <coughs> license enabling people, but in certain specific domains. But then companies like us, we fall in the in-between category. We kind of look at both ends and say, should we be having a captive data center or should we be doing that? If you do that, then the revenues are small. We are not really looking at uh, the scale that comes out to that. If you do this, then we are not really a service provider in the sense that we are IT services provider. No, we are getting to the... Uh, the is we are still looking into it? Not just we. We found that a lot of companies are still grappling with problems, and that's where this kind of thing comes. Because if you see the earlier slide, the complexity of this, this into this, the number of ways in which you can do, that shows what migration of a typical application could be. And an application in the enterprise world doesn't exist in isolation. That's the first uh, reality that one has to work, wake up to. Second thing is, it's an ecosystem of applications that exist. And in that ecosystem, parts of it, parts of a parts of application will be either in the public cloud or on the thing. And conquering the complexity is where I think our strength is going to be. So what is the position of the company? Position is to research in, build up the competencies, serve the customers, and help them make their money, and we make our money in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, where do you address the quality of service requirements? Is it just part of the pricing, or, or it's sort of embedded somewhere inside? Good question. Now, if you are asking me what's the viewpoint from a service provider, then it's something called SLAs are agreed upon, service level agreements. The QoS parameters fits into the service level agreements. And uh, when a data center has multiple options of what tasks to schedule, what resources to allocate, the QoS comes into picture because the SLAs have been agreed upon. And if you closely observe, today, most of the large scale service providers like either Microsoft or Google wouldn't want to commit on very tough SLAs. In fact, they don't guarantee anything at all. And in spite of it, many people have benefited from using the cloud. But then the usage of the cloud is also not that very, what you call the mainstream business kind. It's not like I have a mission critical transaction processing system sitting on the cloud which can take on the surge <coughs> uh, needs, like for example, the high loads, and still I survive out. Uh, I believe the platform, among the, the many platform, cloud platform, uh, there is a Salesforce.com uh, that has uh, a user that has uh, Apex, Apex, Apex environment that is a domain specific uh, environment, is an abstraction over uh, the typical languages Java or such. How uh, do you know Apex uh, from Salesforce and uh, how is positioning? Um, I do not know much about what you said about Apex, but I can share this thought with you. Domain-specific service uh, uh, software architectures are not just li limited to the platform or to the architecture in general at the systems level. We talk about domains of, say, finance or, say, insurance or, say, the biology. So we look into the specific class of problems that a particular uh, approach solves and look at the domain specific, uh, what do you call, um, best practices there. That dictates the architecture and that gets leveraged out here. Right? Welcome. Do you have another question? Yeah. So you talk about just kind of aversion to, to variable pricing. Right. And enterprises are worried that the prices are going to change. Do you think that's a valid concern? Or it, is, it, is. it seems to me that this variable pricing 
is going to exist regardless of whether you use a cloud or you build your own data center. I mean, you have to pay for electricity from some utility. No, they can no, no. The price See the, the, the hardware. I mean, yes, variable they, pricing may not be a real concern. exactly. Variable pricing, if it tends to be volatile, if it's going to upset your budgets, it's a big concern. If variable pricing is going to be steady for a month or two at a time, like suppose every alternate month, Microsoft announces a new pricing. And that's kind of a little predictable, say. Absolutely no problem. That nobody worries. But suppose you are budgeting, uh, say, for an event. Like, for example, there's a, a big Super Bowl activity going on in the US. A bunch of startup companies have started off, and they want to come up with a program that everybody can use. Uh, perhaps an analysis of how the batting or uh, bowling order is done. And uh, for that, they want to have advertisements to be um, uh, priced and sold. And for that, they have to fix the tariff. And at that time, they have to consider the pricing that they have to pay. And suddenly, if that goes up or down, this entire thing changes. right? And uh, that's where uh, pricing, volatile pricing risk is something that architects have to consider when they design these kinds of uh, applications. It's but not uh, exclusively linked only to the managers alone. I think we are a little uh, behind the schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now we have Tatiana, Tatiana Simonic Rossi from the University of California, San Diego. And she's going to be talking about achieving energy efficient computing for future large applications. Uh, Tatiana came about two months ago. About, yeah. about two months ago, <laughs> and her presentation was fabulous. So we insisted in having her in Thanks. this uh, workshop. Thanks, I appreciate the compliment. I hope you'll enjoy it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm in big trouble, right? <laughs> So um, I'm actually heading System Energy Efficiency Lab at UCSD. And the focus of our work, as you can see from the title, is on achieving energy efficiency, in this case, across scale. So from our view, the future of IT is actually bridging the gap from very small devices um, that may exist around us in terms of sensors and various ways of measuring things and interacting with the environment. Those devices already today talk to mobile devices that we carry around us and with us. So our cell phones, our iPads, for those of you who got in the line, and you know, other systems that are basically battery operated. And eventually the data makes it to the uh, infrastructure cloud. Um, the interesting issue here is that energy is a problem across all of these scales. You got a problem with energy if you carry anything that's battery operated or even you know if you go to the outside rim of the circle you have devices that may use energy harvesting where energy is really at a premium. Um, it's a problem to the infrastructure because it costs a lot to operate these data center clouds. Uh, so the question is how do we actually optimize? Um, how do we deliver good performance? How do we, we deliver results that people are after while at the same time uh, maximizing energy efficiency? So I would like to give you a couple of very realistic examples of applications and application <coughs> domains that we've been working with in San Diego area. So what you see on this map is actually a very large scale wireless mesh sensor network. Um, the picture represents only the top layer nodes, so only the big uh, communication links. Under every one of the dots that you see on this map are literally hundreds of sensors and sensor node cluster heads. UCSD is this little dot right over here. The network actually spans about 100 miles inland. It goes 70 miles off the coast, um, and it covers an area from almost down to Mexican border all, all the way up to Riverside County. What's really exciting to me personally about this network is that there are very few computer scientists that uh, do research on this. There are lots of people who do research in other areas and actually communities that utilize this network on a day-to-day basis. So let me give you a couple of examples. On the very low end, um, we actually have a whole bunch of earthquake sensors on the network. The sensors uh, will produce about 5 kilobits per second worth of data, which really isn't a big deal at all. The only problem is, is that they're pretty much all solar powered uh, because they tend to be in these random locations. Um, right now, they're in one mile increments around all of San Diego County. Um, the goal behind this particular application is to study uh, what's going on with seismic activity globally, <coughs> worldwide. And San Diego area was the starting point. Because of the availability of a fast wireless connectivity, this project was so successful that it got recently funding to expand all the way along uh, West Coast. 
um, because they're now able to actually stream the data on a continual basis and catch even the smallest tremors on time. Um, so five kilobits per second, not a big deal, but when you compare it to everything else that sits on the network, it can start becoming a problem. Uh, motion detect cameras and acoustic sensors are actually present in one of our ecological reserves. Um, the study here, what you can see on the left picture up there, is wolves. So there is an indigenous California wolf population that actually lives in this um, area. And what we're trying to, uh, what people are trying to understand is uh, basics of how uh, wolves behave. They look at that from a perspective of video and also audio. Unfortunately, audio and video are physically separated. So video tends to be placed up high, so you can see a good picture. Audio tends to be placed in areas where you don't have a lot of wind. Um, so it's in a different location. And you need to be able to gather these real-time streams of data and correlate them in time, and then run sophisticated algorithms. So on the audio that you can see right in here, uh, they're actually trying to run speech recognition uh, to understand and um, correlate the pattern of the sound that Wolf makes to the behavior um, that they see on video. So here are the two streams of data that you actually need to analyze fairly quickly in real time and that consumes more bandwidth than earthquake sensors. On top, you see another ecological reserve. And actually, the reason why I included this is the student that you see sitting up there. She's actually sitting on a big ledge on the top of the canyon, right up here. And what you see is her laptop with an antenna. This antenna is pointing to our access point. This student can get about uh, 11 megabits per second connectivity on the edge of this canyon. Uh, she can reconfigure all of her experiments throughout uh, about one mile by one mile radius uh, where she has set them up. Um, her job is to study ecology. She doesn't really care about computer science at all. Uh, what this particular network has enabled her to do is to actually uh, study things in real time, both from her office and also to reconfigure her experiments in real time, even when she's in the field, by simply sitting down and pointing the antenna in the right direction. Uh, down here, you can see actually a couple of still images of what used to be a video uh, produced uh, to support California Fire Department. So San Diego, as opposed to Seattle, actually has way too much sunshine, so much so that in September and beginning of October, we have fire season. And unfortunately, fairly frequently, we get very large fires. Uh, and what you probably are not aware of is when the fire starts in San Diego area, usually wind is blowing really hard, it can propagate extremely quickly. And the only way for fire department to know how to deploy their people is to have some way to monitor this progress on the ground. With a network such as this one, they're able to do this from their offices. They're also able to get alerts that tell them this particular area has ripe conditions for the fire or we even can see uh, fire beginning. And then on the very high end, uh, I give you an example of one of the two observatories that we have on the network. And you know, while this is not terabytes of data, we have limited this observatory to 150 megabits per second, primarily because our network actually supports about that much. If we give them more bandwidth, they could definitely eat more. <laughs> you know, but that would mean that nobody else could use the network. Um, so the reason why I include this is so you can see the wide range of bandwidth that has to be supported from 150 megabits per second down to five kilobits per second. And also, you know, all of these examples include some constraints on quality of service. So if you have a fire in the middle of the night and the observatory happens to be streaming beautiful pictures of the night sky, you know, you bet that people will prefer for the fire images to make it first, you know, and to get to the fire department on time. However, this is an event that's unpredictable. So you need to be able to reconfigure and you need to be able to deliver data and compute and detect um, right in time. So this actually brings, um, Another idea that we've been working on, which is a citizens project. This project has been funded um, by NSF and also by industry, and is a project that's done jointly with another NIH-sponsored project, which looks at how does environment around us and the decisions that we make on an everyday basis affect our long-term health. Um, and basically, this project is possible because we do have a large-scale environmental sensor network that we can use to provide feedback to us on a daily basis as we decide to go exercise or as we decide to just be lazy and you know, sit with the laptop in our lap. Um, 
So with projects like this, what you find is that uh, we have a combination of data that comes from the environment, data that's relevant to us as individuals uh, in the form of, you know, how much are you exercising when, also in the form of what kind of genetic background might you have um, that would allow people like healthcare professionals, uh, public health officials, your doctors, and you as an individual make better decisions going forward. Now, if you start imagining a system in which everybody is being monitored 24-7 <laughs> and is getting positive, hopefully, feedback from the system, you are beginning to imagine a humongous amount of data that this is going to create and the humongous opportunities for large-scale computing, both on the back end in the cloud and also locally on your cell phone. If you think about healthcare, you need to have sometimes real-time feedback right where you are. You cannot possibly always rely on data streaming somewhere to the back end and then result coming to you. So you need to be able to actually do computation on both sides and you need to do it efficiently. So here's an example of a clinical trial that we ran. This was uh, last summer. This particular clinical trial was done with our School of Medicine uh, and it focused primarily on physical activity. A very simple question was asked. The question was, if we provided real-time feedback to individuals through their cell phone in a very low-tech way on how much physical activity they've done to date and some small encouragement to do better, would they change their behavior? Uh, how much effect would it have? Um, so for that, we selected a sample of uh, over 60 individuals. Individuals were selected uh, primarily based on um, the fact that they had uh, struggled with obesity. So these are people who typically do not exercise a whole lot. Um, they were given a cell phone and a couple of uh, sensors that were placed on their body, basically a heart rate monitor and an accelerometer. And the feedback was done through SMS and MMS messages. So very low tech. It turned out because they were able to get very real-time information about how much they exercise, people actually significantly increased their activity. They changed their behavior. And the result of this change was much more significant weight loss uh, as you compare the group that we studied that used our system versus the group that didn't. And what I think was the biggest positive outcome of this study is that over 95% of people who used the system wanted to buy it. They wanted their friends and family to use it. They liked it so much. Um, so what we learned from this is people actually do care and they do change their behavior if you provide feedback in a way that's relevant to them. Um, and that is really what motivated our work going forward on healthcare management system where we look also at the environment and its effect. One of the challenges that we found is because we're doing this monitoring 24-7 and providing feedback 24-7, um, energy became a very big issue. Batteries started dying very quickly. So this is what motivated uh, research in energy efficiency across the scale. So I was very happy when Dave Patterson said, well, you know, if you want a research topic, you need to really look at how to do energy efficiency on mobiles and on the cloud, because that's exactly what my group does. So <laughs> I guess I listened to him. Huh? Um, so the idea here is that we have sensors in the environment. We may have some sensors on the body. Those may or may not be battery powered. Some of them may actually be using energy harvesting. So example would be solar and wind. You have a, what we call here a local server or cell phone basically. And then you have backend. And there are sets of tasks that you can assign to the sensors that you can assign to the cell phone and that can run on the backend. There are some tasks that can only work on the sensor, like sensing obviously. But there is a good fraction that you can assign to any part of this system. And the decision of who runs what at what period of time will significantly affect the length of the battery lifetime that you'll have. And it will also affect the amount of computation you end up with at the back end. In fact, in our most recent results, we found that if you dynamically assign these tasks across the scale, you can increase battery lifetime by about 80% on the mobiles, which is a very big deal. Uh, for the particular healthcare scenario we're looking at. So with that, I would like to now focus a little bit more on the cloud side of this equation. You know, so what does it mean to do energy efficient computing in data centers? And for this, um, there are a number of challenges that we're looking at. So what we're monitoring are temperature, power, and performance. So we've been talking a lot about energy, so people are used to thinking about power. Everybody cares about performance. Temperature, I don't think, has been mentioned at all. And yet, if you look at the operating cost of a data center, depending on how well you designed it, about half of this can go to cooling. Temperature strongly affects reliability, and that is why you cool. So you really cannot uh, design a system that's energy efficient without looking at the cooling and thermal aspect. 
What we control are various cooling settings, power states, and task scheduling. So where should the job run? And what we actually look at predicting is what temperature is likely to do in the near future, because it turns out that temperature changes relatively slowly as compared to the workload. We also try to estimate what incoming workload will likely do in the near term. Um, the goal of these predictions is to buy us a little extra time so that we can be more energy efficient. The particular research focus in my group is on looking at both what we can do in terms of individual server redesign, and there it focuses on memory and storage architecture. So what can be done to make a computer more energy proportional? It's not the CPU redesign, it's how memory subsystem actually interacts with the CPU. We look at power management techniques, cooling, and then use virtualization as a method to actually implement all this. So for power and thermal management, we've been lucky to get the funding from NSF Project Greenlight um, to deploy a green cyber infrastructure, uh, which basically consists of a couple of these data center containers that you see up there. And this allows us to play at fairly large scale all kinds of thermal and energy management games um, that wouldn't be possible just within a small machine room uh, that most departments have. So for that, we've developed some power management algorithms and also some thermal management algorithms. And I'll show you in a second a little bit more about each. So for power management, we looked at traces of workloads, realistic workloads running on a whole bunch of different devices. And here, I've just included a sample of two, a hard disk trace and a wireless network interface trace. The reason why I include these two is because intuitively, it would seem like they should look completely different. You know, these are totally different devices. One is much slower than the other. You know, one tends to work with larger size data. The other one works with smaller size data. And yet, when you look at the shape, the shape is the same. What's on the x-axis is the interarrival time between requests to the particular device. What's on the y-axis is one minus cumulative probability distribution of getting those interarrivals. What you see in both cases is that experimental data, which is in this steel color, uh, does not match exponential uh, fit to it at all. Uh, it actually matches a lot better Pareto distribution, which is a heavy tail distribution. The reason why this is really important is because when are you going to do power management? You're going to do it when you have long enough idleness, right? Now look at what happens at long idle times. At long idle times, exponential fit is very poor. It's not even close. The reason why I even talk about exponential distribution is because people use it to model uh, performance, to understand, you know, they use basically queuing theory. If you look at the high performance regime, exponential is actually close enough. So it makes sense in some cases to use it for performance modeling. It makes no sense to use it if you want to save energy. You're going to make a whole bunch of wrong decisions. So based on this, we actually expanded Markov decision process model. Um, and accounted for the fact that uh, we need to have heavy tail distributions to monitor recent history of behavior of the workload. And because we did that, our implementation showed significant power savings. So our measurements were within 11% of an ideal oracle policy. Ideal oracle policy is a policy that knows the future. So as soon as the idle period begins, it knows exactly when it ends. The assumptions were that we have a general distribution that guides the inter uh, request into arrivals, and uh, that we have exponential distribution for everything else, because it turned out that that was close enough, and that everything is stationary. The last assumption is actually the most limiting one. Stationarity tells you that statistical property of all of the parts of the system do not change in time. That clearly is not true. So in order to address that, we actually used online learning algorithm. What this algorithm does is it takes a number of policies that may be a result of our optimization, and then it adaptively selects among them. As it selects each expert or policy, that policy will make decisions. Once a decision is made, we can evaluate how well it's done, and then we update the costs. And in the next interval, we'll select the next best performing expert. What's nice about this particular algorithm is that it's guaranteed to converge to the best selected policy very quickly. The convergence is at a rate that's a function of the number of experts and the number of time periods when you actually evaluate this. So an end result is that you get very good savings even when the workloads are changing. So let me give you an example. You know, in this particular example, we specifically chose real life traces from a data center. In this case, this was done at HP um, that have fairly different properties. So what you see here is the average interarrival time and the de standard deviation. So I specifically picked traces that have significant differences between each other. 
the first table shows you the results if you have each individual power management expert making all of the decisions all the time. The second table, and you can see that one of the policies has been optimized for least overhead in performance. The other one is optimized for maximum energy savings. With our, uh, with our online learning controller, we can now trade off how much performance overhead versus how much energy savings we want seamlessly across the traces. And as we trade that off, we see that our controller will pick a policy that gives us lowest delay when we choose that, and it will automatically pick the policy that gives us the maximum energy savings when we need that. So it's able to adapt very quickly across different traces and across a set of policies. But you can do the same thing for changing voltage and frequency of operation on the processors. In this case, uh, what we're looking at is running from 40% to 100% speed. And as we trade off, again, lower performance overhead, which means you tend to run faster, for more energy savings, you will tend to pick lower frequency setting. What's interesting is that fairly good fraction of the time, you also will run faster, right? Why is that? Well, the reason for that is fairly simple. If you look within typical workload, you would have parts of the time when the workload is very intensive in terms of CPU time, and you'll have chunks of time that can be fairly large when it's waiting for data to come from memory. During those times, you can slow down without any performance hit at all. So this particular uh, online learning um, approach can actually adapt very easily. It can monitor this and uh, immediately pick the right approach. Now, all of this up until now talked about only energy management. Uh, the second half of the equation is temperature. So what this graph shows you is the percentage of time that you spend above certain temperature range if you use a standard Linux scheduler for a set of workloads, if you do energy aware optimization. So in this case, if I assume I know exactly what I'm going to run, and I do an absolutely optimal assignment and maximize my energy savings. That is the result that I'm going to get in terms of temperature distribution. And the last one is if I also do thermally aware optimization. And what you immediately see is that optimizing for just energy savings does not solve your temperature problem. The reason why it does not solve it is very simple. So you're going to maximize your energy savings if you cluster your workload into as few areas as possible and you shut off everything else. Shutting off definitely will cool things down. However, clustering will heat up that area dra dramatically. So it's because of the clustering that you end up with all these hotspots that you see on this plot. So as you think about energy saving, you actually have to look at both sides of the equation. You have to consider thermal uh, constraints. So we did that using the same online learning algorithm that I showed you for the power management. And what we did here is we took workloads that were collected from an 8-core UltraSpark T1 system. And this was done at one of Sun Microsystems customers. So we used their workload. And then we basically took one hour from each day over a period of the week and we concatenated that together to show adaptability. And that's how you get A, B, C, and D workload and then the average on the right. And what you can see here is a set of policies, starting with default OS scheduling. This was actually Solaris scheduler. Thread migration, which will move a thread when things get hot. Power management and voltage scaling, which will basically either go to sleep or slow down when it gets hot. Adaptive random policy, which actually improves on standard operating system scheduling by scheduling uh, proactively to the cores which are relatively cool. And then online learning, which just selects among all these policies. And you can see that across all of the examples, online learning will beat every single individual policy. And in fact, it even beats uh, by 20% in terms of hotspot reduction in comparison to the best possible policy. So being adaptive really pays. So these are great results, except for the fact that uh, every time you do thermal management, you pay a price in performance. So when you migrate to thread, it costs you some time. When you slow down, it definitely costs you time. If you go to sleep, it kills your performance. So instead of reacting, what you really want to do is you want to be proactive. You want to avoid getting hot, if you can, while still delivering good performance. So that is exactly what we did. We forecast the temperature, and based on that forecast, we'll proactively assign workload so that performance is kept at the best possible level and energy is saved. And we did this by taking data from temperature sensors. So every single system has a whole bunch of thermal sensors in it. And you, all you have to do is just tap into them uh, online. So we take the data, we develop the predictor based on statistical model, in this case ARMA model, 
uh, we predicted temperatures, use that as a feedback to a scheduler. Scheduler then makes proactive decisions on how to send workload. And based on those decisions, you hopefully get much better result. Now, obviously, as things change dramatically, you may have to update your model. So we have a very quick online uh, way to update that. And the end result is, as you can see on the right here, over 80% saving, a reduction in thermal hotspots, right? And we do that without necessarily having much of performance overhead. Um, in fact, the only time that you get any overhead is when you run in a very high utilization regime, and there really isn't any way to proactively schedule. You simply have to slow down or migrate. Um, so it really pays to be proactive. And this is why you know, we are convinced that predictive work actually will make a big difference in these systems. We, since last time you saw this talk, we have actually gone a step further and we looked at cooling aware uh, thermal management as well. Uh, the basic intuition is very simple. So it turns out that if you look at typical fans in your server, they run at a fixed number of speeds. So say about five settings is pretty typical. Those speed settings differ in the amount of power. In fact, if, as you increase your speed, power actually is cubically proportional to speed. So the amount of power you're going to lose by increasing speed is huge. And um, as a result, it pays to actually try to make sure that you pack as much jobs as you can into a particular socket or into a particular server up to a point uh, that doesn't cause the next increase in speed, right? So that's quickly, um, you know, intuition behind what we did. We said, if I have a high speed fan and I have a low speed fan, I'm going to look to move jobs off the high speed so it slows down in such a way that the low speed fan doesn't speed up. And the other way around also. I may want to swap threads between those two in such a way that the speed of the fans does not increase, uh, but actually uh, remains reasonably low and therefore uh, make it safe. <coughs> so you can see from these results on various workloads that we ran that you can actually get about 73% savings in terms of just cooling energy. So putting it all together, we've been using Zen uh, virtualization system. We've extended it, which we call vGreen. And what we're doing there is we're actually doing online workload characterization and also thermal characterization at the same time. We characterize e characteristics of every single virtual machine running on every single server and every single processor. And those characteristics are aggregated uh, all the way up to the node level so that we can make decisions that have to do with individual VMs and also individual physical components. And then we use that to perform scheduling, power management, thermal management, and to make migration decisions, if any. And you can see from preliminary results that even in highly utilized systems, so these are systems that are running at 100% utilization, which is not really that realistic, uh, we're able to get good energy savings with speed up. And we get this because we're monitoring characteristics of each VM and we schedule VMs that play together well on a single socket or on a single server. That is really the only reason why we get these kinds of savings. Now, as utilization comes down, you can see where the savings would clearly go up if you have ability to utilize more power and thermal management knobs on your server machines. Um, so going forward, I'm leading a fairly large uh, center. Uh, it's actually through uh, MUSIC, which is, stands for Multi-Scale Systems Center. The goal of this is to manage energy across uh, all of the different layers within data centers and to show uh, and to ensure that energy will be consumed only when and if needed instead of wasting it. And we do this from software layer all the way down to platform and hardware level. Uh, there are a number of faculty involved uh, from UCSD, UC Berkeley, USC, Stanford, and Rice University in this project. So we're really trying to look at this from a holistic perspective because we believe that you cannot solve an energy problem by just doing a software solution, by just doing a hardware solution, or even just solving the cooling problem. You really have to think about it as a whole. So to summarize, the key is really to ensure that we monitor what is going on in the system. We develop policies that are aware of what's coming down the line, that are aware of the hardware characteristics. We can't just pretend that hardware works perfectly and works equally everywhere. It doesn't. We, in fact, need to leverage these differences to our benefit. And as I've shown you, we have done some first steps toward implementing uh, power management and thermal management policies that behave well. And we've started integrating this into a vGrain virtualized system. So that's, this is pretty much all I had to say. So we can ask questions without any microphone. So please, do you have any questions? Yes. So uh, do you have uh, a study of how software influence uh, 
efficiency of systems. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes. So actually, Alan Snavely, who is right in the software energy management team, has worked with me on looking at how we can predict the amount of uh, the type of performance and the energy cost that future applications are going to demand out of uh, future hardware. And how would one then design those applications and design the hardware to meet that? Um, basically, the concept behind this has to do with creating profiles of the machines and creating profiles of the applications. These profiles of applications are basically looking at relatively simple kernels that you can detect as the application is running. So you're not looking at the source code of application at all. You're just monitoring it running on today's system. And as it's running, you gather enough information to figure out where are the critical hotspots. Then you convolve those two together to, to figure out what is going to happen if I take today's application on some new system or the other way around. You know, what if I take some future application and run it on a today's system? What am I going to get? And based on this, then we can actually make some better decisions. Yeah, so that's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how did you uh, actually measure the performance? Uh, purely on, on response time, or what did you measure CPU usage? So it depends on application, and that's a great question. Um, so if you look at um, multi tier applications that have response time guarantees, then yeah, you know, we basically measure response time, you can measure the bandwidth. Um, if, for the examples of video streaming, you know, you can actually see the quality of the experience, frame drops, and so on. Um, so it's a strong function of what it is that you're actually running, and that's part of the challenge here. And then, you know, if you look at what happens within the kernel, you actually don't have a good way to get the idea about performance. And that was one of the challenges that we looked at, is how do you provide this feedback to a virtual machine scheduler so it knows what to do? Because otherwise, you know, how is it going to make it better? The plugin for the Xen type so we actually created a very thin layer interface that allows application monitoring and feedback into the virtual machine in a way that doesn't create overhead. Plugin in the VM of Basically, yeah. Yep. To Xen motion. Yeah. The yeah. first experiments you were measuring energy consumption. Oh. Uh, are you taking care of the? consumption for air conditioning and things like that? Yes, yeah, so I talked a little bit about that. Uh, we haven't done at the scale of a whole room, but we are capable of doing it. So uh, what we have right now is ability to actually measure how much we're consuming at the whole level of the data center container, because we're measuring the amount of power that goes in, and also we know the rate at which water is coming in, what temperature the water is, and then the rate at which it's going out and what temperature it is when it goes out. Uh, so based on that, you know exactly how much you're consuming on the whole box level. Now inside, we also measure all of the temperature distributions at the racks, um, at the heat exchangers, then at the servers themselves. And we know all of the fan speeds. So you can kind of figure out you know, and allocate the costs across this. Um, we are not quite at the point where we've developed policies that run at that scale. Um, so I started sort of from the server and then started scaling it up. Um, and a friend of mine who is working at the software level more, he started from the top level, you know, monitoring everything, and he's working his way down. <laughs> One of these days we'll meet, right? <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, very thanks. Much. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Zach Hill, and uh, presenting our work on the early observation on performance of Windows Azure. So, um, we've seen a lot of talks today about people's applications on the cloud. So we did this and we did that. Um, but we kind of took the, the perspective of an application developer looking at these new technologies and trying to decide, um, do I want to use it? And more importantly, if I do, how do I build my application um, in Azure <coughs> specifically? So the question is not, um, can I do it? But, but how should I do it? And how should I design my application to best utilize these services that are provided um, in this cloud environment? Um, so specifically, we're focusing here on how does do various Azure services perform um, kind, of, kind of somewhat in isolation. Um, and we ran these experiments between November and January, so just as it was coming out of uh, the CTP and into the final um, commercial release. So with some slight disclaimer that you may see something different than this um, if you run these experiments today, and you may see something different than that tomorrow. Um, as we all know, there are precious few performance guarantees given by any of the cloud providers. Um, so 
we kind of give these out as general recommendations on things we've seen and experiences we've had working with the cloud, um, but certainly you have to take, take all of these with a, a slight grain of salt. Um, so here we kind of present a, a fairly typical application architecture. You see things like this uh, fairly often in um, documentation and literature. Um, you have some users submitting requests to some web-based front end that goes through a load balancer um, that, that hands off work to some task queue and in the back we have workers that operate on these tasks and do some sort of batch processing or whatever. Um, and they then interact uh, with various types of storage, uh, tables, blobs, um, SQL services. So we're going to kind of look at each one of these individually. So first I'll start out with uh, looking at kind of what's the performance we can expect when deploying and scaling the compute resources themselves. So we're not looking at you know, how many CPU cycles are we getting, how fast can I execute this algorithm, but if I want to actually deploy an application and scale it up, for instance, what kind of performance can I expect? How long does it take to, to do these operations? So I can kind of give you an idea of the kind of parameters you need to take into account uh, when you're designing an application, so particularly scalable web applications and things like that. Um, We'll also look at the storage services, so we'll do some benchmarks of, of the task queues, the tables, and blobs. These are fairly straightforward uh, measurements, but we, we think they're, they're interesting in the results, and particularly with relation to some other metrics, um, such as the direct TCP communication, which was released, oh, was that January, I think, or December, when they announced the feature of allowing worker roles to interact directly via TCP endpoints. This was not part of the original Azure offering. Um, originally, uh, these instances could only communicate through the storage services, but now you can actually define a direct TCP port and, and make direct connections. So kind of how does that fit into the larger performance picture? Um, and finally, we'll wrap up with the Azure SQL services, so their actual relational database in the cloud, and how, how does that compare with um, either what you would find in a local LAN environment and, and what kind of uh, parameters do you, can you expect for scaling it and performance um, when you're actually writing applications against it. So starting off with the deployment and scaling. Um, so our methodology here uh, was to kind of evaluate how, how long it takes to deploy and how long it takes to scale. Um, so we, apply, we uh, deployed applications from the blob storage itself. Um, the deployment packages were essentially trivially small, so less than five megabytes, so we can kind of erase that out. Um, and we measure the time to start the deployment. Um, so we present some numbers for some different uh, instance sizes. Um, in total, we, we ran eight cores. So for instance, um, for the small type, we, we start up four instances and then we scale it, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and for medium size, we start up only two because those are two cores, so you kind of get the math of the cores. Uh, then we also measure the time to actually double the instance count. So we start out measuring how long it takes to bring up four instances, and then what if we want to bring up another four, and how those two numbers relate, um, and what can we kind of expect. And these, these uh, experiments were run between uh, December and January. We ran it 431 times, so if anybody's really interested, we can give you this nice long plot with every single data point. You can see the variability and stuff. We will omit that for this talk. Uh, we simply don't have time and, um, or the space. We actually did experience a failure rate of 2.6%. So 2.6% of the time, one or more of the instances didn't come up. And that's worth noting because, um, again, with the hype surrounding cloud that you always get this stuff, uh, that's not necessarily the case. You don't always get the, the resources either right when you request them or at all. So you have to account for that when designing your applications. Um, so here's the time to deploy um, and the time to see the very first instance come up. So here we have minutes in, in the scale, which is noticeable in the first place that it's even a minutes um, scale. And here's the, the various uh, VM instance sizes, so small, medium, and large. And then we distinguish between web roles and worker roles. If you're not familiar, um, the web role essentially has IIS attached to it, and it hooks, it hooks itself up to a load balancer. So based on that, we kind of expect the web roles to take a little longer, and indeed they do. Um, we also maybe or maybe not, depending on your perspective, expect larger instance types to take a little longer. Um, this is, it, it, it's interesting that they do, but not significantly. So if you actually look at the, the time per core in some sense, extra large you get eight cores in 13 minutes versus one core in, in nine minutes. So these kind of design trade-offs are interesting um, if you need lots of resources very quickly. Um, that's actually your best bet. Um, but overall, the, you know, the first kind of impression we had when we saw this is, wow, it takes 10 minutes to bring 
bring a VM up. Why is that? Um, so if there's anybody here from Microsoft, I would love to have a talk with you of why it takes so long. Um, I'm not convinced that's an absolutely necessary. Um, and even more interestingly, um, when we compare starting it up to actually scaling it, so then doubling the instance size here. So we add four more VMs. Um, and so these are, these are stacked charts. So you can see the total time at the top is the total time to bring to double the entire uh, deployment size. So here, the worker, um, I should note these are all small instances. I only present the data for the small instance types here. So from the time that we already have four instances running, four uh, worker role instances, to the time we get four more, it's just under uh, 14, 15 minutes um, for that. And so we can see, uh, as it, again, as expected, uh, no, wait, that start for scale is significantly longer. Um, so the first ones come online, and then we see kind of they, they trickle in. So there's also no guarantee you'll get all your resources at once, um, although I should note we have seen some slight changes in the behavior recently. So um, some recent experiments as of literally a few days ago rerunning some of this, we actually have seen these, these gaps shrink significantly. Um, I haven't anal analyzed the data enough to say whether this goes up or this comes down. Um, but it's, it's worth noting, and certainly um, when you're talking about dynamically scaling applications, when it takes 20 minutes to bring up five more, four more instances, that's something you need to take into account, particularly if you're trying to follow some workload curve, right? I mean, if you're trying to match your resources with some uh, workload, you need to know that you need uh, you know, 10, 20 minutes of lead-in to actually match that. So the takeaways here. Um, deploying the VM takes about 10 minutes. Is this too long? Uh, we think so. In a lot of cases, that could be a hindrance. Um, we have not really run a comparison with other, with other cloud providers. Um, I could give you anecdotal um, kind of information that we've seen significantly shorter uh, times for some other providers. Um, but for actually Windows instances, it's not actually that different, which is, is telling in itself. Um, adding instances takes much longer than initial deployment, so kind of be aware um, that dynamic scaling does have an overhead and it, it's not quite as instant as, as we or many other people would like it to be. Um, as you increase instance type, it will take longer um, and you have to account for the fact that you won't get all your instances at once. This is actually, actually can be good and bad, as I'll talk about later with the storage services. Um, speaking of which, uh, we'll look at each, each one of the main storage services. So the blob storage, table storage, queue storage. Um, I won't go into what each of these really is and how they really work if you're interested in that. There's plenty of documentation. You can come talk to me later. Um, we can kind of discuss the, uh, the intricacies a little bit more. Um, but suffice to say, that blobs provide large kind of unstructured storage, big chunks of bits. Um, tables are semi-structured data, although not in the classic RDBMS sense. Um, they're only semi-structured. There's no um, enforced schema, but the kind of typical query, insert, update things. And then the queues, which are fairly self-explanatory. Um, so we'll start off with, with the blob service. Um, again, the limit. <coughs> Let's skip that since we have time. The get and put semantics. Um, and according to Windows Azure, um, performance is isolated between blob containers. So blobs are these objects and they're kind of grouped into bunches by these containers in a naming sense. So you have a container that contains some set of blobs. Performance between these containers is supposed to be isolated um, in terms of uh, where they're located and, and, and stuff like that in the data center. You can't count on them being near each other, etc. cetera. Um, so we test uh, the performance of getting and putting a blob within a single container. So we, didn't, we did not span across containers. And we actually scaled between 1 and 192 concurrent clients. So for the get action, we scaled between 101 and 192 gets on the same blob and for put, putting those, those blobs into the same container. And what we got here is, okay, that's right. Um, you see the per, per client bandwidth is in the vertical scale. So this is from the perspective of a single client within the deployment. Um, and we scale it between 1 and 192, as I mentioned. Um, and so for download, we see a single client um, gets about 13 megabytes per second download from the blob. So when you fetch that one gigabyte blob, you're getting, which um, works out to be about 100 megabits per second as the Azure specification states for what you expect network performance to be in a small instance type. So these are, we, we did all these uh, tests using small instance types so that we could get that high um, uh, scalability number. 
Um, and we see the performance degrades um, reasonably. So the big takeaway here is that it's not infinitely scalable, certainly, especially when you're accessing um, a single entity. And so you need to be careful how your application uses the storage. If you scale up 50 instances and their first action is all to go fetch some in initialization data from blob storage, you need to be careful how it's organized because you can see significant uh, performance degradation uh, depending on how that blob is, is organized. Um, how it's distributed in the storage system. Um, uh, additionally, we see here um, upload is, is significantly slower than the download, which is somewhat to be expected. Um, and I'll keep moving because we got to go quick. Um, so here's kind of uh, the service side perspective, the cumulative bandwidth. So if you add all those up from each client, we see the service itself is supporting, we max out at about just under 400 megabytes per second, which is kind of an interesting number. Uh, we weren't quite sure why that was. Um, we kind of had assumed maybe it's triple replicated and each has a gigabit, but that adds up to about 375 megabytes per second, not just under 400. So um, there's still some, some investigation to be done here. And again, because of performance variability, um, do we know, uh, you know, will this change over time? Who, who's to say it won't? Um, but it's interesting. And upload was significantly slower as well. Um, but again, that's expected since there are replication issues involved. So quickly moving on to the table service. So table service basically has this entity attribute value model where entities are, are essentially rows, attributes are items within the row, and each uh, attribute can have a, a value and a name, et cetera. Uh, again, semi-structured, no schema. So the question is, you know, how, what kind of performance can we expect when we're running queries and uh, inserts and updates against this storage service? Um, so we perform each of the four primary uh, operations, insert, query, update, and delete. Each client operates on its own unique entity, so they didn't have uh, row conflicts um, directly, but they're all within the same table and within the same partition. Um, and Azure has this feature where each table um, is kind of divided into partitions, which are dependent upon explicit values that you put in the, the row entities themselves. You, you give them a partition. So we worked within the same partition, um, and we performed uh, basically 500 of each operation for each client, um, with the exception of update, which only did 100 ops. Um, so at the end of the insert phase, which was the first phase, there are approximately 220,000 uh, uh, entities in the table. And then we, uh, upon that, we operate uh, the queries and updates and deletes. Moving on, so this is our performance um, graph. On the left, we see the table performance uh, using four kilobyte entities. We have data actually on, on many different sizes. We present 4K here because it's fairly uh, typical of the various sizes and there wasn't dramatic difference um, between the entity sizes um, such that we, we think you need to present all the separate ones. Uh, but so query and insert are interesting here because um, not only do we have a weird kind of uptick with, with low concurrency, um, but they don't really vary that much. So we actually are pleasantly surprised at the scalability here. Um, from one to 192 clients, we only see, you know, 30, 40% variation in performance, which is actually fairly impressive um, for both query and insert. Delete, um, we can't say that, and uh, it, it grows quite quickly. Um, and update, which is on the right here, is it's a whole different story uh, altogether. And we present each of the different sizes here. So you can see for the different entity sizes, it didn't really make a significant difference in terms of performance. They're all basically about the same. Um, um, given the average operation time, but it, but it quickly gets to be quite expensive uh, with high concurrency. So be careful how you design your tables. Um, again, this is a single partition, so within the same table you could use multiple partitions to kind of spread this load and uh, get better performance in that regard. Um, so the queue service is kind of the last of the three primary storage services, and it's intended for passing reasonably small messages in a basically FIFO model, um, get, put, peak kind of our, our typical uh, queue operations. Um, and so here we just test concurrency against a single queue and, and see kind of what, what a, a queue can handle um, using various message sizes. So we, we change from all the way down to 512 byte messages all the way up to eight, 8K uh, messages. Um, so put and get are the ones we really care about. Peak is basically uh, consistent across uh, the concurrency um, level. I should mention that the vertical axis here is message per second and that's seen from a single client's perspective. Um, you can do a little bit of math if you really want to get absolute latency numbers. Um, but again, 
Uh, so for put and get, particularly at scale, again, the size of the message becomes less important. Um, so actually using larger messages um, as you need more concurrency is a better way to get more bytes through, through the interface. Um, but it, it scales reasonably well. We kind of, we think 32 concurrent clients is about the inflection point um, at which we start to see degradation of performance beyond. Uh, so so it's take, you get approximately 50% less messages per second after you uh, pass that barrier, uh, regardless of, of uh, message size. Um, so now let's we'll talk kind of very briefly, because we are getting short on time, on the, the direct TCP communication. So this is a somewhat new feature, um, useful. It allows workers to communicate directly without having to pass messages through this queue. So we have a much, potentially a much lower latency communication operation. Um, because there's no intermediary required. So we just ran some, some open a TCP connection, transfer a file, and kind of measure the bandwidth and the latency that we observe. And we actually ran these tests for a, a long time, you know, several weeks. So again, if you really are interested in, um, we can talk about kind of variations over time. And I actually do have a graph to kind of point out some interesting, um, interesting artifacts that we kind of discovered and, and have some uh, observations. So here, kind of a histogram view. So of, of all the, the samplings, uh, or I should say, of all the experiments we ran, um, the cumulative performance. So um, I can't read it. Um, the way to kind of read this is that um, about 55, 65% uh, of all uh, tra file transfers that we performed via this TCP got 80 megabytes per second or greater. So that's kind of how you read this. So percent is, is uh, the, the speed or greater. Um, so we see most of them, you know, at least 50% got actually very high performance. And this is very interesting when you consider this is also on a small instance type, which is supposed to be limited to 100 megabits per second. This is clearly well above that threshold. Um, so we are, we are interested in figuring out exactly what's going on here, um, which I'll talk about in the next slide, um, kind of theories we have, although, again, it's a black box. So uh, we're not quite sure. Latency, reasonable latency. Um, uh, again, because this is a data center, we have no real notion of how far apart these objects really are. Um, but, but reasonably consistent and not a, a huge variation, not nearly like what we see with the bandwidth. So there, here are all those data points. <laughs> um, you'll notice immediately there's a reasonable amount of variability between these tests. Um, these were run every half hour. Um, for several weeks, um, and the two troughs are the interesting points. Um, so what really happened there? Um, a couple of ideas, uh, but we have no concrete data. So the, the, the real takeaway here is you can't really count on any specific uh, performance number you get. Um, we don't know, <laughs> because of this kind of weird um, coincident, uh, this weird occurrence where we're getting much higher than what we actually expected. You know, we expected this 100 megabit section. And we're getting much higher than that. So we're, we're looking at, is this really the correct numbers? Are these the correct numbers? And we just got lucky a lot of the time. Um, so could there be some co-location issues or multi-tenancy? Um, you'd actually reduce the bandwidth. Um, I don't know how Microsoft actually enforces the, the bandwidth limits. So that's one possibility. Or we could have just had some random network occurrences, high load elsewhere that, that caused this. But you can see it, it's clearly variable over time. And you need to take, it, uh, take that into account when you're designing applications. And I will wrap it up with our uh, quick look at Azure SQL services. So this is kind of the most traditional service here, um, the RDBMS um, that everybody is familiar with based on SQL Server 2008, I believe. Um, it is size limited to less than 10 gigabytes per, ga per database. So that's an important factor when you're designing uh, your application. If you expect your database to grow beyond 10 gigabytes within a single database, you have to find a way to partition into multiple physical databases, not even between tables or but full databases, which that does not fit all workloads. Um, so we ran the TPC uh, E benchmark, which is an online transaction processing benchmark. Uh, it simulates a stock brokerage house, um, so updates and, uh, and stock tickers and things like that, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and the database that we use to test against is about three gigabytes in size, so kind of right in the middle, not, not right up at the upper limit. Um, and here's, here's a breakdown by the micro benchmarks. So each of these is kind of a defined transaction within 
the, uh, the suite <coughs> of benchmarks. And in the blue here, uh, we actually ran the benchmarks on a local machine that we had in our lab. So it was a quad core, uh, uh, quad core, I think a Xeon, I'm not sure if it was a Xeon or a Core 2, um, with I think 8 gigabytes of RAM. And so kind of a standard uh, local server. Um, and then we compare that to the performance uh, between this, the uh, SQL services in Azure and a client also running in, in Azure. So we see you know, this is kind of the, the Azure LAN case. Um, and on average, which is right here, this is the average case, average across all the micro benchmarks, uh, we see about a 2x slowdown uh, that you can expect. So that kind of, um, we've looked at which ones of these are reads and which ones are read-write intensive. Um, there seems to be no consistency um, between the performance differences between those that kind of average out. Um, we're investigating this a little further, this why it's actually faster in Azure than it was on our local system. Um, because Microsoft gives us absolutely no specs on what these SQL server um, instances are running on in terms of hardware um, or, or even their virtual uh, resources, it's hard to compare uh, directly um, and, and, and claim that this is some resource contention issue or, or anything like that. Um, but on average, you can expect a 2x slowdown. Um, I will move really quickly. So we also did some transaction slowdown. Look, so percent. So here we see um, as we increase the number of concurrent threads that we're running transactions against the database, um, comparing again this local LAN server with the Azure cloud, we see. Um, Azure actually scales reasonably well to numbers of, uh, to concurrent clients, uh, more so than our, than our LAN server did. Uh, at this point, we actually saw a fair number of failures locally. Um, that's why we don't have data for all the, the different data points. Um, but, we, but we can maintain uh, below a 2x, or uh, below a, a yeah, <coughs> this is, yeah. Um, so we're kind of calling the uh, inflection point here about 30 concurrent threads. Now we can stay under that 200% um, slowdown factor up to 30 concurrent threads. Um, and this is showing how we actually saw commit failures as we increased um, the concurrency as well. So these are actually transactions that failed to commit. Um, and we lost a data point. <laughs> but this is the local server again. So we, it degraded rather quickly. So. Um, Looking at this data over time, so we ran these benchmarks for uh, several weeks and, and we saw fairly consistent performance. So this is uh, kind of a high level trace of each of the micro benchmarks. And so we, as you see a little bit of, of jittering here and there, and this was actually um, a case where the client machine that was running the benchmark against the server actually failed and, didn't, and we didn't know about it for a couple of days. So it's kind of another lesson learned is, is be careful. Um, what happens because even though it's supposed to recycle, Azure is supposed to be recycling these VMs if they fail, um, it actually failed and then failed to recycle, so it just died altogether. Um, so kind of another lesson learned. But we see reasonable, reasonably consistent performance, um, particularly given that this was during the CTP phase, uh, so while the, the beta building and, and testing was still going on. So general recommendations and conclusions. Um, be careful of how you do the scaling. Um, beware that because it's dramatically uh, slower than the initial deployment, um, you need to look at the workloads them themselves to determine uh, when it might or might not be worth it to actually scale. If you have a lead-in time of 20 minutes to gain more resources, um, will the workload peaks have passed by that point, essentially? Um, distributing blob accesses across many uh, containers is one way to contain uh, or maintain higher performance. So, so don't point all of your instances at a single container or a single blob. Um, the tables scaled fairly well for most operations. Um, update and delete were the two notice, noticeable uh, exceptions, but this is fairly expected given the nature of those types of operations. Um, and the SQL services uh, scaled reasonably well, but it, it's, it's tough to really recommend using something like that for a scalable application because of, the, again, the size limitations. Um, if your database is expected to grow, um, and as we've heard a couple times today, they never shrink, um, then you need to be very careful of how you, um, how you appropriate that. Surprises. So the big surprises were, why does scaling take so long? 
and uh, why is TCP performance not the same as blob performance? So this is, these are kind of the areas that moving forward we kind of would like to investigate and talk with the um, Microsoft and Azure people, if possible, to see what's really going on here. Um, I should mention um, that similar to what work we've been doing, there's also a new uh, application out by the Extreme Computing Group here at MSR, the Azure Scope, which provides some similar benchmarks. If you're interested in running some of your own kind of benchmarks like this, they provide some examples and stuff that's actually uh, we found fairly interesting towards the end of our work. So I will conclude so we can move on. I guess I'm not. <laughs> I have an explanation for your surprise. Uh -huh. I guess you have a small instance, right? Mm -hmm. So is there a small instance on one machine, you probably have a small instance. Mm -hmm. each, each instance have one core. Mm -hmm. And they compete with the benefits sometimes. So it depends. The other you know, neighborhood in your machine, if they don't use networking, then at this moment, your small instance can have all have, can have all of the benefits. If your neighborhood, uh, yeah. Also using the bandwidth, then you could So we had, yeah, we had looked at that. Um, that was one of our kind of things we thought might be the the case, but it's not clear in terms of documentation whether yeah. this 100 megabit is a guaranteed minimum or a guaranteed maximum. Um, yeah, so it's kind of hard to interpret what 100 megabits mean. Do well, I, so I always get that, or will I never get more? If you have a larger, extra large instance. Yeah. 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 So that's that was. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent point. That's one of the kind of issues is how much are you really contending and and and. Yeah, so you know. the problem, the reason, the um, it, it's kind of up to the client behavior. Are you using your HTTP or HTTPS? Are you using your parallel loading? Are you using you know you can download in parallel block? Oh, parallel. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or you just do a regular sequential uh, downloading? Ours was a regular sequential regular downloading, sequential. yeah. Um, again, we didn't think that number was actually surprising given that we expected to get the 100 megabit uh, network limit. Um, so if we could actually get more than that, that would also be surprising. <laughs> um, so and use HTTPS or HTTP? Uh, HTTP, not, not S. Not S. Yeah. No encryption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions?